further ado, let me introduce Barbara Esman, longtime workshop leader, as I'll be telling you in a moment, who's going to be introducing Jordan Piagorski. Barbara has a long connection with the Writers' Center. She's led workshops here since 1995, and she served several years in our board of directors. She's a National Endowment for the Arts, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Virginia Commission for the Arts Fellow, and a Red Book Fiction Award winner, among other distinctions. Her two novels, The Other Anna and Not Night Ride Home, have been published in several foreign editions, and both were adapted for television by Hallmark Productions. She co-edited an anthology, A More Perfect Union, Poems and Stories About the Modern Way. And she has taught extensively in universities. Uh, and this is a wonderful, I'll let Barbara talk more about her relationship with, uh, with this Jorah and his book, but this is a wonderful success story for the Writers' Center because we have people who come here, they have a story they want to tell, they're not sure how to tell it, they're not sure how to write it, they're not sure what form it's going to take, whether it's a novel or short stories or a play or nonfiction or creative or whatever, whatever form it takes. And they get wonderful instruction here uh, from people like Barbara. And then, as in Jordan's case, go on to get published. So this is the kind of thing that we love to see at the Writers' Center. I'll tell you that a couple nights ago I had a dream about doing this introduction. <laughs> and I was wearing a Japanese kimono and funny slippers. And my ex-husband showed up with Lucille Wallace's date. <laughs> I can't explain that except probably Halloween candy and Grey Goose do not mix. <laughs> um, as far as, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I sound pretty good on paper. Uh, but I'm also an alum. I started here. Yeah, see? And um, so this is the second generation. And I think I can qualify as sort of the midwife for this book because I was around for quite a few versions of it. Um, Joram, of course, is a great scientist in his own right. He's um, an NIH scientist emeritus. He established the Lab of Molecular and Developmental Biology at the National Eye Institute. Um, so the science in this book is accurate. It comes from someone who knows. Um, and I think what's interesting about it, it's also about creativity. I think once I was, I had a comp class and I was trying to get the uncreative to be creative. And the one kid that caught on was the physics major. And he got all excited. And he said, that's exactly what you do in science. Mm -hmm. And you don't think of that. But I think a lot of this book is about the serendipity, about the exploration, um, and how these things happen to come, and how you have to fight for them. I mean, you know, we're at, a, we're at a very sort of grad grind part of our culture, where I keep thinking of Dickens' hard times, you know, everything's got to be practical and it's got to be, you know, right there. And um, Joram's defending the opposite view. Um, one thing about this book, too, is there's a lot of people now who, they, since we all have uh, PCs, they type 300 pages and went, <laughs> look, I have a book, I'm ready to publish. And I do a lot of developmental editing with people like this, and I keep going, no, no, you're not. And they go, <coughs> so they actually say, I don't care if it's right. I just want the book, OK? And I can't tell you what frightening things they have gone on to self-publish. <laughs> um, space aliens, we've got them all. But with Joram, it was different. Joram wanted to do it right. He wanted to learn the craft. He wanted to learn the skill. His sweet, supportive wife, Lona, my God, she would go through a million versions of this, just go on, go do it. And, and he did. He worked at it until he learned the skill and produced a wonderful book. And, and for that, we should all be thankful. Thank you, Barbara. I mean, um, I, I do want to thank publicly the Writer Center. It's just an amazing organization. And um, I um, first workshop I took here, I was still doing science work for many years. Um, Kate Blackwell uh, took her workshop, and I went in there absolutely trembling with fear, and did some writing, and had to start at the bottom and 
worked my way up to, uh, to learn to write. And then I took Bob Bausch's workshop and Barbara Esmond's workshop and uh, just on and on uh, to try to learn how to write. And I'm still learning as we all are. It, it's such a challenge. So let me just quickly uh, give you a quick view of this book. It's partly autobiographical, but it's largely fiction. It's kind of a merger in and out. It's generally, and not just specifically, but generally it's about chasing dreams. It's about the similarities and conflicts between science and art. It's about the importance of and the limits of narration or storytelling in science, which is absolutely an important part of science. And it's also a warning about the possible adverse consequences if the government with good intentions actually suppresses academic freedom and destination free to sort of curiosity driven research. If they forget about that and they uh, start acting in the moral compass of uh, creative individuals, uh, what can happen? So it's a kind of prophecy and warning in that sense. But more specifically, the book starts in the mid-21st century, 2047 actually, and the US economy is depressed and the very scary epidemics of disease are sprouting up here and there and all over the place. Because science really hasn't delivered on its promises to uh, cure all the diseases. Genetic engineering is still in process, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't done it all yet. And people are getting sick and they're dying and they're scared. Um, so funding for the government at this point now is entirely for medically directed research. Basic research has no longer been significantly funded in 2047 because people have to, use, have to be cured and the taxpayer's money uh, needs to be given to the people who are sick for that purpose. It's an honest, well-intentioned idea. Don't take money from people and taxes and not give them something directly in return. You can't, you can't ask for more than that. <clears throat> in addition, the story opens with uh, my protagonist. He's 70 years old. His name is Ricardo Stein uh, because he's from Argentina, S-C-T-E-I-N. He's an immigrant. And he's an eminent government scientist who has excelled uh, doing clinical research, but he has been frustrated his whole career by not being able to do the kind of adventuresome research of just following his nose, so to speak, ivory tower kind of stuff, and he's not, it's just not done anymore at that time. And to make matters really worse, and to give some punch to the book, Alilian, his wife of 40 years, who he's very much in love with, pleads with him to do research to help people. She's a social worker herself. Uh, help people with intractable diseases. And so, as she dies, in, essentially in his arms, saying, please, promise me that you will help other people. And then since observing the behavior of his cat, Mulligan, many years ago, instead of helping other people, Ricardo has always been obsessed about the idea of entering the mind of an animal, of another species. He wants to see the world and experience the world, not just as a human being, but as an animal experiences the world. So he's got all these conflicts, his wife, the government, the funding, his dreams of being able to, to uh, see the world in many different ways. Anyway, his wife dies, and he's very, very unhappy. And at that point, he's at home, and I will begin to read when he discovers that jellyfish have eyes, which, by the way, jellyfish do have eyes. Depends on the species, on how well developed it is. But these eyes are absolutely remarkable. I was going to show pictures here, but it's just a little bit. I'm staying out of my science life. <laughs> but uh, uh, they like a human eye. They have lens, they have cornea, they have retina, they have pigment. They have mumbrots of them. They can see all the way around. If you think you can run away from a jellyfish, forget about it. You can't. It sees you. And it's actually totally remarkable, these eyes, which <coughs> impressed me when I was a scientist. And I went to where Ricardo's going in La Fargera to study them. I, I did that myself. So uh, it's personal in that sense. Ricardo's first wedding anniversary, it would have been their 41st after Lillian's death, fell on a Sunday, making that weekend especially lonely. He had planned to go to a movie with his neighbor, but the movie had canceled due to a bad cold. Ricardo didn't want to go by himself. Doing things alone made him miss Lillian even more than staying at home. He also felt self-conscious going to events that most people attended with family or friends. 
So that Sunday afternoon, he went for a brief walk and spent the evening ambling restlessly from room to room. Lillian and he had always celebrated their anniversary at Leo's, a local restaurant famous for freshly baked bread and sinful desserts. Despite being slightly overweight, he had always indulged on their anniversary. Now, without Lillian, he had no appetite for dinner. What's this? He ambled. He mumbled to himself as he picked up a book in his library in the evening on a survey of vision of invertebrates that he'd never found the time to read. He placed it in the table next to Lillian's picture as a young woman dressed in gym attire. Her irrepressible smile of good health made him feel lazy and overweight. He lit logs in the fireplace, turned on the small lamp next to the photograph, and sat in his favorite armchair that they had bought shortly after they were married. He loved its worn leather skin. Time to discover something new, Ricardo said quietly to Lillian's picture before opening the book. She had always loved jumping into anything new, traveling to places they hadn't been before, eating food they had never tasted, learning expressions in foreign languages. He skimmed the first few chapters, which were full with diagrams and classification schemes. A number of chapters were devoted to the compound eyes of insects, especially the famous fruit fly, Drosophila. He grew sleepy as he turned the pages and dozed off. Chilled once the logs had burned to ashes, he awakened, threw on a fresh wood, and returned to the book. And then came the great moment, not announced by trumpets or fanfare, but by the quiet turning of a page to the chapter on Nidarians, the invertebrates that included corals, sea anemones, and jellyfish. Seeing the jellyfish picture transported Ricardo back to that Sunday afternoon many years ago in the Baltimore Aquarium. Imagine that, Ricardo explained to himself now when he saw the diagram of the jellyfish eye in the book. An eye? He turned his hand, he turned him to Lillian's picture and asked, can you believe that jellyfish have eyes? The jellyfish eye had a large cellular lens for transmitting light, a retina with photoreceptors, and black pigment in the back of the to dance and scatter. It looked like a variation of a human eye, except the cornea in front of the eye was reduced to a single layer of cells. Despite the fact that he'd studied eyes for almost half a century, he had no idea that jellyfish had eyes. He doubted whether any of his colleagues knew either, although he, had, he read in the book that the jellyfish eye had been described already in the 19th century. He smiled at the irony of a vision scientist not knowing that jellyfish have eyes. He looked at Lillian's photograph once again and said, I guess we all live in the proverbial black box of ignorance. He suddenly had an urge to break out of that black box. And he did try to break out of it. He applied for travel funds in his institute and he wanted to go. He had found out that uh, Puerto Rico was a place, La Parguera, University of Puerto Rico, there was a man there who would be willing to help teach him how to collect the jellyfish. And he went there with his very close friend and colleague, Benjamin, um, and they, uh, they learned. And after doing a day of collecting in the swamps there, um, he, uh, Harold, the person who taught them, the professor at University of Puerto Rico, said, you know, you can catch jellyfish at night if you go and you put a light on the dock, on the water from the dock, and they come up. And it's a way you can get a different species. In the morning, they had, sat, they had uh, caught Tripedalia, the name of the species. But this other species, Charybdia, a different one, was similar and also had magnificent eyes. So they decided, Benjamin and his friend, to go to the dock that night. After sunset, the two scientists made their way down the sloping path from the laboratory to the dock. Benjamin carried the pail to collect the jellyfish and stared at the ground as he walked, concentrating on the work at hand. It will be interesting to compare the eyes of these night <coughs> jellyfish with those from the daytime, Harold said. That Charybdia was several times larger than the Tripedalia, so I guess their eyes will be bigger and easier to dissect. Not necessarily, said Ricardo. Bigger animals don't always have bigger eyes. Whales are huge, but their eyes aren't proportionally bigger. At least that's what I've read. As they walked, Benjamin rambled on about how size differences between the two jellyfish might affect protein content of their lenses and other tissues and how many jellyfish would be needed to do the various analyses and so on. Ricardo lagged behind. 
The lush, humid air reminded him of summers in Argentina. He stumbled now and then on rocks as his mind wandered. He felt young again, not burdened with the pressures of funding and bureaucracy, of helping students find jobs, of tiptoeing past the demanding eye of his boss, Dr. Topping. Finally, he was living his youthful dream of adventure. The moonbeam vibrated on the water, splitting the distant bay into complementary halves. From a distance, the tranquil tree-lined bay looked like a postcard. Well, maybe not that peaceful. He imagined drama beneath the soft skin of the sea, sharks hunting seals and turtles prowling for jellyfish. Nature's beauty often camouflaged the ugly reality of survival. Of course, he couldn't enter the mind of another species as he had uh, wanted to since he was a boy, since he had his cat Mulligan. Ricardo thought of the complex platypus that saw prey with its eyeless beak. How could an animal that required eyes to ever penetrate the mind of a different species that could visualize its environment without eyes? Evolution had made it impossible for one species to enter the mind of another. Survival strategies had to remain secret to maintain the tricky balance of life and death which were sublime and cruel at the same time. Ricardo mused that nature solved problems without stated mission objectives and committees to establish <laughs> priority. Evolution <laughs> progressed without morality or responsibilities. Beauty existed without a beholder. The idea of justifying a jellyfish adventure to Dr. Topping or anyone else, even to Lillian, if she had still been alive, seemed ridiculous, like trying to explain a poem. Flashes of brilliant bioluminescence danced on the surface of the water, reminding him of the jellyfish green fluorescent protein that had led to the Nobel Prize in chemistry in the last century. Such perfect merging of dispassionate nature and human curiosity <clears throat> had led to being able to detect the positions and movements of proteins in cells, even to greater understanding of how cancer cells spread. Once again, he reminded himself that great strides in medicine often came from unexpected places. Perhaps his basic studies were fulfilling Lillian's plea. He must let his dreams and beliefs be trampled. Come on, Ricardo, urged Benjamin, who had already reached the dock. Coming, answered Ben Ricardo, picking up his pace. Where can we plug in this lamp? Benjamin searched for an electrical outlet for the light. How do people do science under such primitive conditions? Would you rather be back home, Ricardo asked. He remembered Harold disparaging the rat race. Did Harold's life amount to less than his or Benjamin's? How did one judge a successful life? By counting the number of publications or honors received? Ricardo pondered, not for the first time, whether he had chosen the wrong career path. No, certainly not. If he'd been a poet or a novelist or anything else, he would have fantasized about being a scientist. There was nothing more remarkable in nature. Here's an outlet, said Benjamin, plugging in the lamp. Let there be light, and there was. And now let's see if these jellyfish really swim toward the light. Ricardo stared at the colorful reflections of the light beam on the water's surface. I'll miss it here, he said. It is nice, Benjamin agreed. He looked around and inhaled the moist air. It reminds me of Tel Aviv. I wish I could bottle up her gear and take it home, Ricardo said. Wouldn't that be nice, said Benjamin. Home continued to echo in Ricardo's mind. An empty house, solitary bed, pressures to meet the demands of his fundraising obsessed boss. Once he returned, would he even remember the La Parguera he was experiencing at the moment? He doubted it. To know La Parguera, one needed to see the bay and mangrove swamp, watch the crabs crawling on the mangrove roots, feel the mosquito skin, see uh, sting, see the thin dogs scraping food in the streets, the small brackish water, smell the brackish water, and sense the hot sun burning one's skin. Memories were reproductions, not the real thing. They dulled and mutated and couldn't be trusted. But then Lillian came to mind. She hadn't changed in his memory, or had she? The small empty boats along the dock rocked gently in the water. The locked boat, boat house looked like an abandoned shack. The night version of the marine laboratory was very different from its daytime version, quieter and as if a blanket covered nature's mysteries. The two scientists coexisting in the same environment, yet their minds in different worlds, sat down to eat their sandwiches. They engaged in small talk while keeping their gaze on the water for the jellyfish to come to the light. 
Dozens of small fish swarmed within the spotlight on the water. Squid darted by with astounding speed. Visible one instant, gone the next. Their tentacles gave the illusion of a rotating propeller. Several hours passed, but, not, but no jellyfish. Too bad, said Benjamin. He didn't sound as disappointed as Ricardo felt. At least we got plenty of trypodalia during the day, responded Ricardo. Our plane leaves tomorrow afternoon, so we might as well go back and get some rest. Hey, what's that? exclaimed Benjamin suddenly. An angelic, translucent form with trailing white, lace-like strands. A single jellyfish rose from the depth. Ricardo watched, transfixed by its majesty. Why had it taken so long to arrive? Did it live directly below the dock, or had it traveled from afar? How far? What did it expect to find at the water's surface? And most importantly, what did the jellyfish see, and what would it do with the information? Ricardo dipped the net into the water and gently scooped it up as if it was making, when it was making a U-turn to head back to deeper water. Five more jellyfish followed within as many minutes, and the eager scientists captured each one. As with Trypodalia, these jellyfish traveled in groups. Ricardo wondered how they communicated with one another. No more jellyfish appeared during the next 15 minutes. Benjamin unplugged the light. They took the bucket containing the six jellyfish to the laboratory and returned to the motel. In the morning, they would excise and freeze the jellyfish. Ropelia, which is the structure that the eyes are in, would freeze the jellyfish ropelia containing the eyes to take them back to their laboratories for analysis. Now, should I to go on a little more with that report? Okay. I don't know. Okay. So anyway, they go back to the motel. And uh, they've had this very stre strenuous day, <clears throat> and they're thinking about things. So Ricardo stuffed Kleenex in his ears to dull the enervating rattle of Benjamin's snoring. <laughs> that he couldn't sleep, however, had nothing to do with Benjamin's snoring or the room's noisy air conditioner. Even after the long day and night collecting jellyfish, Ricardo felt elated and energized. The majesty of Charybdia rising from the depth obsessed him. The scene came <laughs> over and over in his mind. He longed to tell William about Harold and the jellyfish and the mangrove swamp. He went to the window and peeked through the slate, uh, slate of, of the Venetian blinds. It was a dark, dreary night without stars. A stray dog sniffed an open garbage can across the street. The motel room had a musty odor. He thought he heard cockroaches scampering in the bathroom, but concluded correctly that cockroaches don't make noise, <laughs> at least none that humans could hear. Suddenly overcome with anxiety, Ricardo lay down again. He felt claustrophobic, squeezed by the darkness, as if trapped with no escape. The sporadic noise of the air window air conditioner was welcome company. Benjamin, sleeping soundly on his back, had finally stopped snoring. Ricardo imagined himself in a coffin with his hands folded across his chest, but he didn't like the idea of being dead. He pretended that he was asleep, but that didn't work either. He listened to the tick-tock of his bedside clock, if only he could manipulate time and make the sun rise early to chase away these nocturnal demons. He wished he had brought his valium to La Paguera. He thought of Lillian. She was the light, his light in the dark shadows of the night. If only he could talk to her into the early hours of the morning as he had in the past. She would stroke his arm and say nice things, reassure him, love him. He would hug her. He always assumed that she would outlive him. Exhausted, Ricardo nestled his head between two pillows to block Benjamin's snoring, which had started up again. He closed his eyes and floated in a boundless universe of nothingness. His anxiety faded as he carried downstream, as if carried downstream by a gentle current. He was no longer in a hurry for the morning. In the twilight zone before, between sweet sleep, before sweet sleep, Ricardo remembered Lillian's hand on, in his, her flesh firm and warm not withered like when she died. He imagined his lips against hers, moist and receptive, like when they were young. How good it felt. A surge of anger flashed through his brain. What gave cancer the right to rip Lillian away from him? What did the jellyfish do to deserve being hijacked from their home and imprisoned in a metal bucket? It was all so unfair. Finally, Ricardo succumbed to sleep. He dreamed of the mysterious jellyfish in the dock, by the dock. 
Like messengers rising from the dead, they propel themselves through the water effortlessly. He heard them saying, we are alive. It was as if they were heading to a known destination, yet drifting at the same time. They were impossible to grasp and slipped through his fingers when he reached out to touch them. More groups of jellyfish streamed from his dream, streamed out from his dream. They pulsed in synchrony as if linked, yet each was an individual, alone, like him. A few jellyfish were large, adults. Others were small, like children. They dissolved and reformed over and over again, dissolving and reforming, merging and separating. A diverse fauna, including sponges, corals, sea anemones, starfish, and sea urchins, entered his dream. The various species clumped with their own kind, although a few mavericks trespassed into groups of other species. The feathery sea pens resembled plants more than animals. One wondrous sea pen lifted magically from its spot and started writing in the water as if it were a quill dipped in black squid ink with no hand to guide it. The words dissolve, hiding a secret story. It's a blur, Ricardo told Benjamin at breakfast the next morning, frustrated that he couldn't relate his dream more specifically. But maybe the details don't matter, he said. Dreams are so often that way, memories and yet not, images without explanations. It was mysterious and beautiful. Benjamin listened patiently. As they finished their breakfast in silence, Ricardo thought about Trichodalia that swam in groups in the mangrove swamp and about the six Corinthia that appeared one after another at the, dark, at the dock. He recalled how the jellyfish merged and separated, dissolved and reformed in his dream, and how invertebrates plumped with their own kind except for the occasional maverick. Of course he couldn't explain it to Benjamin. He didn't understand it himself, but he did know that it felt right. Well, I can say.